Okay, everybody, and here we are. Welcome back to Sales is King. It's a special edition. We've got another great video today, and um, I'm pleased to have with me Paul Bickford, who I had the pleasure of meeting a few weeks ago at the Dallas Sales Enablement Society chapter, and I was really taken by Paul's presentation, which was absolutely outstanding. So I thought it would be great to bring him on today and talk a little bit about um, how he is leading um, this transformation as far as how people are selling today. And one of the, the things that we talk about here on, on the program is about this radical change that's going on in the sales process today. And I thought it'd be very valuable for you guys to listen to someone who's out there on the front lines, who's leading the charge for companies today and seeing great success. So welcome, Paul. Great to have you on the program. Uh, Paul is a sales enablement, a global sales enablement and training leader. Um, he's worked for a number of organizations leading sales and global training and transformation. He's got a book coming out, so we're going to have a great conversation. Paul, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you having me on the program. Yeah, absolutely. We've been trying to get this scheduled for a while and happy we finally nailed it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's always nice, right? Everybody has so much yeah. going on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we'd love to hear your take on what's going on kind of from a high level in sales today, your experience, what you're seeing um, as far as the changes happening in sales. And then we'll get into a little bit about what you're doing to kind of help teams uh, navigate that uh, change. So tell sure. us. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I, I've seen a lot is a real shift from, um, uh, you know, being able to really wanting to set up long-term strategies for sales success at the sales individual contributing sales level to a lot of um, really salespeople being squeezed or feeling pressure for results right now. And so one of the things I've noticed is instead of setting up um, calls and trying to get where you're creating a need from a customer to want to start a project to purchase uh, your software and do an evaluation of what they're using and to call into place that, you know, the usual suspects and all that, that had a real chat, had a real challenge with salespeople only wanting to talk to prospects that are already in play with someone with a competitor that's already initiated all of that and done the heavy lifting so they can just put their information down on the spreadsheet <laughs> to be compared. And it's, it's, you know, it's not a lot of heavy lifting, but when you do that, you only have a 10% chance of closing the deal. Whereas if you can start the vision or re-engineer the vision, what happens is you have a 90% chance of closing the deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm you know, trying to teach these guys that when you've got a spreadsheet, you know, the columns are the competitors and the rows are the capabilities. Well, whoever sets, whoever's column A, they set the vision of what the best in class capabilities are. So the prospect says, okay, it should do this, it should do this, it should do this, it should do this. And they can pair those rows against the competitors that come in and say, well, how do you do this? How well the job do you do here? but there may be capabilities that competitor has that won't be an extra row. So it's not a fair comparison. So if you can't get back in to, con to, to control the conversation and re-engineer that vision, they won't go through. And the challenge is I've had, you know, salespeople and sales managers and I'm saying, yeah, I know, but I got to get stuff that closes this quarter and anything that um, we have to start, is not going to close this quarter and we're being pushed and it's a, what have you done for me lately? And so it's, it's, I found it's hard for um, people to have the discipline or an environment um, or structure where they can be more sophisticated about really taking and nurturing and pushing deals through. Because everybody agrees academically, but mm -hmm. real world, water cooler talk, reality on these calls, it's not happening. And, and they're not even being pushed to do that because those same leaders are also hard pressed for results. And so in some ways it's cannibalizing Mm -hmm. long-term efforts because every quarter then you're starting from scratch because you don't have things you've been working consistently through that have any magnitude to help you with what your quote is. Um, and something that uh, I learned at our Sales Enablement Society conference, uh, Dr. Howard Dover talked about a comparison to sales right now to what happened in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, if you recall that, Dan, yeah. where he talked about, you <laughs> know, when um, farmers, their, the price went down on their crops the, the, you know, the, the year after they had a good year. So every farmer plowed twice the same amount, twice the amount of land thinking, well, then I need to sell double the number of crops to make the same money. 
and it destroyed, you know, economically, it created this huge gap where there was too much supply, and not enough demand. And it was horrible, a horrible piece of American history in that part of the country. And Howard talked about that sales organizations are saying salespeople aren't selling. Let's hire more salespeople to go after that. And, um, you know, and it's, it's really a false positive that that's going to be something that's going to impact us. And so um, I think the other big thing I've seen is we talk about CSO Insights, love the company, uh, great data. You know, some of the guys from CSO Insights are in our Denver chapter of the, Pres of the Sales Enabled Society. Um, they say that only 58%, or I'm sorry, 53% of salespeople in 2017 um, hit their quota across, you know, 3,000 sales organizations. Mm -hmm. It's down from 60 uh, seven percent or something like that the year prior and a lot of the conversations around why is that what do we need to do to make them hit these numbers fair conversation my thought though is who's coming up with these numbers where are these quotas coming from <laughs> right you know what I mean right How it's always top down right? and it's supposed to be bottom up and so versus you know I talked to, to a sales leader about this not too long ago and he said well we just put 10% on it every year, 20% on it every year, even if they haven't hit it. And so now all you're doing is creating a bigger and bigger, bigger gap and then saying, what do we need to do to get them here versus going, is this realistic? Where's this coming from? You know, what are we doing? And we're burning people out and we're having people that don't, um, you know, perform and, and just a real challenge with that and people buying talent and paying for people that are experienced and bringing them in. An organization I was working with very, very uh, recently in software, bringing in people from SAP and Oracle and uh, and the like, and they're not staying. And they're like, "Well, what's wrong? We 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 get we were hands off. We weren't micromanaging them, but we said just go do what you do. But you still have to bring them into the culture. Right. You still have to show them the processes. You still have to get them to understand who to go to for what work best in the system. And um, you still have to manage people, and you can do that without micromanaging a top performer. In fact, you may know this, Dan. Data shows it's a whole lot easier to take somebody that's already doing well and getting them to do better than a poor performer trying to get them to just hit that minimum metric. So mm -hmm. I, I know I'm talking about a few different yeah. things that are yeah. probably all married together in some kind of mosaic here, but um, these are just some things that have been on my mind recently as I'm working with companies and helping companies. Cause the other thing is what have you, when's the last time you assessed your people? How are you hiring your people? Do you have somebody that assessed well as a salesperson? but they have account management skills and not, and not hunter skills, and you've got them doing business development where they would be much more successful inside field sales. Do you have managers that are really skilled, maybe in strategic thinking, but not in um, you know, uh, coaching and development? If so, how do you know? And where are they spending their time? And how do we improve those things? So that's one thing when I do, when I work with organizations on what I call Salesforce transformations, mm -hmm. we look at all of that, lay it out, come up with the metrics, the systems, processes, people, things that need to be adjusted, improved, lay out a battle plan shoulder to shoulder, and then launch it off and put it into place with, uh, again, I guarantee results, uh, every dollar that is spent with me at 10 in return. And that's if they, I always say that's if you do a poor job of follow-up when I'm done with you. So it's really nice when you, when you really can get visibility into all the elements that focus on sales productivity and sales success, and everybody does their part, it's hard not to get results because it's, it's, a science, it's an art and science, but the science is the process and it's proven to work if everybody's doing the part that, that they're supposed to own and, and, and driving and facilitating, being the conductor on that is something that you know, I've got a lot of passion around. Yeah, that's fantastic. It really seems like it's, it's a holistic system that really needs to be working uh, hand in hand and together. Um, for it to really start to drive results. Getting back to one thing you said earlier, and it's something that we, we talk about a lot on the program is, um, you know, when sales gets, it, it's almost like, um, you know, you would think if you're getting involved later in the process and it's, they're almost about to make a decision that you might have a greater chance of getting the deal, but it's actually the reverse. You know, starting in early, trying to set the buying agenda, mm -hmm. uh, or as you said, re-engineering it is really much more powerful. How do you help the teams kind of with that mindset or what, what needs to be in place for the sales teams to be able to get more of those kind of agenda setting 
uh, engagements? Is it, is it engaging higher in the organization than they are traditionally doing, or what are some of the keys there? Well, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, like how they're calling into, but I mean, even calling, calling high, they're still just, they can still just be searching out for current projects that are being evaluated. So it's really about having a mindset of trying to, um, trying to set up a conversation where you're addressing what are the, what are the issues, what are the business challenges that you're facing? How are they impacting you? What is it costing you because they're not that way? What would it look like if you had that money? What would it look like if you didn't have those stresses and those, those, those problem solving measures that you have to take, take on regularly? What would that look like for you? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to accomplish and what are your goals? And where are you at in relation to those? And asking questions about the business, the product should be the very last thing. Right. And what I teach people to do is to say, learn about the business, where the gap are, you know, with offer, say, what do you use now? And how long have you had it? And were you there when the made the change was made? And what, what, what um, benefits were you hoping for when you um, implemented that? And how long has it been? Okay, so in the last three years, how have you evaluated and measured if you've received those improvements that you were looking for? And most don't do it formally, so they go, I don't know. Um, so is it, I mean, it sounds like it's really great. I mean, is it, is it doing everything you need it to do? I mean, and they say, well, you know, it depends. So just getting people to go through these, these um, conversations and then the part that I feel like is really distinct that most don't do and it, and it can be more challenging to do but you know the biggest competitor in software and I would argue maybe even b2b is no decision it's not that they picked x competitor or you it's that they decided the pain of change was far greater than the pain of remaining the same and they just you know now nah, status quo status quo right yeah so what you do is you show look you only have so much runway with your current state you're bleeding this much money if we don't do anything you're losing this much money based on what you told me not anything i'm asserting and so gosh if you could if you could save even half that wouldn't it make sense to do so and see now i have a frame of reference to come up with a budget as i think about what our pricing is as i think about where they're at because one of the challenges i've heard from salespeople is well, I don't want to call into a prospect that they don't already have a budget and they're not going to have a budget if they don't already have a, um, a project in place or an evaluation plan in place. And so I say, you just get them to look at somebody started where you, where you want to start. Somebody started there with nothing to get it to where you want to come in. And this is how you get it started by showing the money you're already spending and losing. Exactly. And it's like, Dan, if I'm sitting across you and I do this sometimes when I'm working with a client to, to, to prove a point, about my return on investment for what I do is I'll say, Hey, do you have a dollar on you? And they go, yeah. I said, give it to me. And, I go, uh, and they'll pull it, they give it to me. I'll hand them a $20 bill. I say, you keep that. And I say, how many times do you want to do that? That's what I do for, for companies. That's what I do for sales organizations. Oh, I love it. You know? and, and I think that's what we have to do for our prospects and our clients. And if we can prove that we can do it and do it well. Um, but on, honestly, I think it's two pieces. One, it's a lot of work. And I think because they haven't done it and usually don't do it and they still have their job, they're still making some money, they think, I don't want to do it. And they don't do it. The other thing I think, to be fair, is they don't maybe know how to do it. Or yeah. They're comfortable doing it. And that's where the, uh, the training and the coaching and the accountabilities come in to drive that. So anybody that doesn't want to, you either you know, get them there or you find that maybe they're not in the right space, right spot. Um, and for those who don't know how to, getting into a place to have the comfort and the confidence to execute in a meaningful way and holding manners of managers accountable to model good behavior show them what good looks like don't say when you get on the phone make sure you do this when you talk to a client make sure you manager you do it show them say watch me now you take the next one all right we're going to go see this customer and we're going to go see this prospect for this meeting and i want you to really focus on this or i want you to watch i'm going to do this part of it i want you to watch how i do it this is the kind of thing that's proven lots of data, right? Like uh, uh, J. Edward Deming says, with, <laughs> without data, all you have is an opinion. <laughs> and so it's nice. We've got lots of data to show. When you do that consistently, you improve performance. You get a higher level of buying and engagement. So people stay longer with you and want to work for you and with you. And uh, the biggest thing is, you know, the sales results, the revenue. Um, but you got to have those pieces in place and that's what I help uh, companies with because you can do training initiatives and 90% of all sales training money is wasted every year and there's data on that 
because it's not reinforced. There's no follow-up. They don't address what's called the forgetting curve. Um, they don't make it meaningful uh, for people to practice the skills in the learning environment versus just telling them what you want them to know. And um, all those things are so important. You know, I think of like a recipe, you know, a little of this, some of that, cook it this long, whatever. And people want to do, throw something in the microwave that's supposed to be a, you know, where they, but they want a, a five-star gourmet dish and they throw something in the microwave and they say, this tastes awful. Right. right? But it's because right. they didn't do it right. No, that's so, exactly anyway. right. Yeah, that's great. So, um, and we'll get into the kind of how you do this in a minute, but I, you know, one of the things we just had our last episode was we were talking about um, the key trait, the key trait for salespeople in 2018 is going to be curiosity. And it's really, that's the big thing that I think is moving out of the comfort zone of kind of the pitch, you know, the, the demo and get more into the consulting, the question asking, the problem finding, you know, uncovering things, you know, and setting the stage, you know, getting the prospect to think, you know, and suddenly they feel a little more of a, a connection with you because you're not just the traditional sales guy looking to just jam something down their throat. You're trying to help them with some issues. You're trying to learn more about their business and get them thinking differently about it. So, you know, very relevant. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so let's, let's assume, you know, you get engaged um, to help uh, an organization uh, with this type of transformation. What are the kind of steps that you typically go through? Walk us through a little bit some of the different components. Sure. So the first thing, too, I use some medical analogies sometimes, you know, and you got to diagnose before you prescribe. And sometimes <laughs> they say, what would happen if you went to a doctor's office and uh, you didn't tell them what was wrong with you and the doctor showed up and he shook your hand and said, I'm glad to see you. I know exactly what you need. And he writes you a prescription and he says, here, take two of these. Uh, for two weeks and you'll feel better. Hey, thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Yeah. You know, you need something and you're like, well, what? <laughs> we have what? a sale on this medicine today. <laughs> right? And so that's what we do if we come in and say, well, you know, let me help your group and I'll do this and this and this and this. It's like, well, let's make sure we know what's needed and all that's needed because sometimes we only know part of where a gap is or part of where solutions needed. So we want to be comprehensive. So the first thing I always like to do is a full-on just needs assessment. And so, um, the way that works is I'll um, just kind of hear from the, uh, the president or CEO, um, you know, what's going on with the organization, what's going on with the sales group, hear from the sales leader, um, you know, what are some challenges that you're having, and then explain the very first part of the process is we do assessments of uh, people, uh, the systems and processes. Everybody fills it out. It takes about 45 minutes for each person, and the, the data we get back is amazing. There's like 856 data points in here. It's still very digestible, but the, the, the information is 100% actionable. And I say, we'll get answers to questions that you don't know to ask. We'll have visibility into um, leadership, into coaching, into development. We'll find out not just who can sell, but who will sell. You know, if we need a recruiting tool, we'll look at, are your salespeople, they have the right mindset to sell. You can have the right skills and tools and the right people, but if their mindset isn't there, if, if, um, if they have a high need for approval, for example, based on low self-esteem, uh, family of origin stuff, whatever, mm -hmm. then they're not going to ask for the close. They're not going to be as concerned about being respected in the sales process because they want to be liked and they're going to be more meek. Um, you know, it, it, it helps override some companies I work for. They say, oh, we've used, um, you know, assessments from other organizations, and I won't say their names, they're kind of the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. And, but what they do, the, 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 the standard assessments only assess for predictive behavior. Predictive behavior does not equate necessarily to predictive results. So Dan, let's say you're taking an assessment, a company wants to hire a good salesperson, and you're to answer these questions, and they say, Dan, are you someone that at a party is willing to go up and strike up a conversation with people you don't know? I mean, yeah, I'll do that. Most assessments will say that you're going to be a rock star salesman and you're going to really want to prospect and, and cold call and do that sort of thing, which is not true. Do you know why, why do you think that is? Any thoughts? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh... Well, is it the same? Are, do you have this, or do you feel this? even address things the same way that you would at a party that you would for your job? No, obviously I'm more relaxed. Right. And I'm, you know, yeah, it's, the, it's, it's out of context. 
You know, it's, it's like somebody saying, hey, sense, so, so, uh, do stand up right now. Do it. Tell me a joke. You know, it puts you on the spot, right? It's different than if it just happens organically. Right. Yeah, yeah. And your livelihood's tied to it. And there's just a lot of things there. And so what's nice is they get at your mindset. They get at what your competencies are. Um, they're uh, one of the, you know, they get at how do you spend money? So Dan, if when you shop, so let's say you're, Dan, you're going to go buy a car and you talk to five dealerships, shop around, you look, 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 you take a few weeks off, you look, look, look. You th and then if you're dealing, because that's how you buy things whether it's a TV or anything else. So if you're talking to a customer in a sales situation, they say, yeah, I got to think about it. Now I want to talk to some other people. You go, okay, because that's how I would do it, which is not what we want in a salesperson. We want to overcome objections and address concerns and, and speak to and move things forward. So these are the kinds of things most assessments don't bring into account. Um, and then they talk about, too, how do you use the strengths that you have? So, for example, for sales manager, um, it may assess, you know, certain competencies. So for example, it might say, Dan, your strategic thinking competency is at 82%. You're excellent at that. Mm -hmm. But based on how often you use it, you know, the row below on the table, you only go to that 20% of the time when you're trying to solve a problem or, or um, work with your group. Um, coaching, coaching and feedback, you're only 30% good at that. And you go to it 80% of the time. Kudos to you. Most managers need to go to it more. You do, but we need to improve your skills at that. And hey, let's look at you spending more time with strategic thinking where we should. So it's very sophisticated, but not overly so. Not in a way that you would get caught up in paralysis by analysis or get a headache right. with it. It's very simple. And it also assesses, again, we've got salespeople, but do assesses for sales competencies, but it also gets nuanced to hunter sales skills for business development or account management sales skills for inside sales and you may have somebody that's in the wrong seat or somebody that still needs to be in that seat but they need to improve their competency in those areas and so we do that first mm -hmm. lay out all the things that need to be adjusted from an enablement standpoint you know skills training tools processes technology anything and leadership whatever and then we plug and play and set up you know, the training, make sure we address and change any processes or improve any systems, uh, make sure the right marketing tools and processes are in place. And then the secret sauce, the secret sauce. After we do training where they're practicing skills application in the learning environment and their managers are there in the training with them, they get certified. So this, they have to take a test like in school to prove they know it. Prove, don't tell me you've been exposed to it. Don't tell me you've seen the PowerPoint. Don't tell me you sat in this class before. Prove to me that you know it, otherwise it doesn't matter. And now they have to prove they can do it. So they take an oral certification with the managers. And oh, by the way, I certify the managers in advance. So the managers also have to prove that they know it and can do it if they're gonna coach to it. And also with the big heavy um, uh, focus for me on having the managers model that best in class behavior with real clients to show them what good looks like and now the secret sauce kicks in with the coaching, consistent cadence of performance, management, oversight, ensuring that they're doing it, helping them till they get competent and comfortable, like whatever they were doing before they did this. Now something magical happens, Dan. Now something magical happens. They will start to own it. You know, I always say, I'm carrying your stick to managers. I'm like, I'll get them excited about it. It's going to be solid content. And we're going to make sure that Everything's in place for them to have the best opportunity to execute and be excited about it. You're the stick, and I say that somewhat loosely, meaning holding accountability. This isn't some initiative of the month. This isn't a flavor of the month. This is how we do things now, you know? And then they'll start to, the water cooler buzz will be, hey, I call it the holy cow, this really works. Um, because they'll start seeing successes and they share those testimonials. And, um, and then I set up peer mentoring networks and frameworks using um, uh, things like, uh, there's a great new product in the market called Just Sold It by a company named Radiate Buzz. And it's basically someone can type in, um, I've got a, a deal in the industry with a company that's this size um, with these variables and hit a button and it will show them anyone that's closed very recently a deal of that same type and size that they wouldn't have thought or known to reach out to and sync with them immediately on things that will never end up in marketing content. You know, that informal tribal knowledge, like, well, definitely don't bring this up. Here's how I handled that. 
you want to, you know, I, I try to separate this group first before I bring in that or whatever. And, um, and then peer mentoring a uh, program that I've done very recently, they set up a program where the champions of the methodology were helping those that were struggling and we're turning them around in a matter of just a couple of weeks. Um, we've got one guy, they've got one guy they were telling me about who um, was in the job for uh, just four months and he wasn't getting any traction. And um, uh, he was ready to quit. He said, maybe this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. And somebody that had been through my certification program, like this guy had, but he was struggling, said, hey, I want to help you. Or he asked if he could mentor him or something. And he coached him. And just after a couple of weeks, the guy was blowing it up. And at the end of, I guess, the end of that, whatever the, the time frame was, he ended up being the number two guy on his entire sales team. And uh, being able to... Um, himself work with and coach other poor performers and so you see that kind of thing and you go wow and i i say i want to take credit for that part but i can't because they did it and that's an example of how they'll own it if we set it up for them and they'll feel empowered and want to embrace it when they see that it's helping them they're making more money they have less stress mm -hmm. they're more efficient with how they spend their time how is that not a win but you got to get them to believe it you got to get them to do it and you've got to coach them through to where they're comfortable with doing it. And um, once we do that, I'll help set a performance management structure into place for the senior leader to the managers. Because that's usually where there's a gap. Most people don't even address that one. And then the managers to the, to the salespeople um, with that kind of framework. And then um, from there, that's where I kind of back out. We'll do another assessment like we did at the very beginning, Dan. And we can show a nice delta and trend line of where people have improved from where we started to where we ended. And of course it'll still keep going as long as they keep mm -hmm. with the performance management um, framework that's put into place. That's phenomenal. And from start to finish, what sort of timeline would that be in this type of program? It, you know, it, sometimes it can depend on the size of the group. I like to do like at least a six month engagement because mm -hmm. space learning over time, it takes 21 days to make a habit. And if we're trying to engage and grain a lot of habits, you know, American Management Association did a study once of people that went through training of any kind, any kind of training, any kind of industry. And it was um, 15,000 people. And they said, um, of the training you went through, they took a third of the people and said, they, who said, I want to apply 15 of these things right away and own them and make them part of my DNA and drive it and crush it and I'm pumped. There were a third of the people, they said, I'm gonna take four to six things and apply those immediately and really make that my focus. And the other third, they said, I wanna take the other 5,000, I wanna just take one to three things and really own those and drive those and make those part of my process. And they followed up with them six months later and they said, of those 15 things, group one, how many of those things are you still doing? And they said, none, none. Not that no, no, none of the 5,000 were doing any of the things. The average person was applying zero. Um, the group that had four, six, how many things are you still applying? It was about 50%, two to three things. And of the group that said, we want to take one to three, the average person, 100%. So when I teach classes and I say this, I said, does that mean that you should take one to three things and throw the rest out? No. But you got to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you frame it out and say, we need to do all this, but I'm really going to focus on getting good at this part first. And I'm going to keep learning. And then I'm really going to focus it on this part. And it takes time to do that. Plus just the general coaching, the general getting comfortable with doing these things. Cause you're talking about shifting the, the function, the structure of a group is a lot of heavy lifting. And so you want to give it the time that it takes because most trainings, and that's why 90% of all sales training money is wasted. They do sage on the stage come in, the good ones will still do skills practice in the learning environment, and then say, okay, well, good luck and Godspeed, and here's some tools to use, and go out and get them, and go team. But that doesn't convey to making the learning stick to long-term learning. It doesn't convey to transferring that into long-term behavior change. It doesn't convey into embracing a working dynamic with managers and their people that are meaningful and useful for professional development across somebody's uh, job and, and to help them in their career. And that's why you want to take time. Really some, it's best to do a 12 month. Mm -hmm. It's just about how much you want, um, how much you need, how big is the group. Um, but I like to do at least six months. 
we can do three if it's a really small group, but really um, the tenure of learning, you know, scales regardless of the number of individuals. So I really try to, to, to stick to that, you know, at least that six month spot. And in working with the, the teams um, in, in the kind of training part, so say for example, you're, you're helping them get into more of this question asking mode. Mm -hmm. uh, is that like a, you know, multi time per week type of um, role playing type of thing with um, in, in a group environment where people are kind of weighing in on what they're hearing so that everyone's learning and, and like multi time a week for six to eight weeks or what's kind of a, what would be kind of an average uh, type of um, uh, look at that? Yeah, so it depends. So there's multiple touch points. So one thing I really like to focus on, and I'll steal the term from Barbara Maziotti, who's in my network. She's a, another Denver, I mean, I'm sorry, another chapter president for the Sales Enabling Society who talks about real plays versus role plays. You know, and real plays are where you get, um, where you get somebody to actually, either you get uh, somebody to agree to be a customer or you have the salesperson think it's a customer and it's not so that you're not burning through leads um, and you get into what's called problem-based learning because it's a real situation and now they have context for the information and actually I, I like to do that a lot of times even before we do initial training so they can see where the gaps are and, and realize that it's a challenge a lot of times that's for, for new hires but um, but anyway so setting up things like that where we've got phone call meetings for field salespeople where they're on calls trying to get them to record those calls in states where they're able to do that certainly for a sales development group calls you know getting recorded so that we can listen to them and they can coach themselves sometimes getting I say you can do asynchronous coaching where have your salespeople um, record a call break it down and send it to you and then let them critique it and say here's what I thought went well here's what I would have done differently whatever send it to you kind of like on performance reviews you're supposed to write a review on yourself for your manager to look at before they write a review on you same kind of thing but it makes you be interactive and involved um, or if it's not recording a call, manager sit in on the call with the salesperson, you know, and, and then say, all right, how do you think that went? Um, have them kind of, you know, document and talk about it and then say, oh, you know, why do you say that? And that gets into what I teach around how to coach. You know, side note, Dan, one of the challenges with sales leadership, and this really goes up the food chain too, right? Politics aside, I mean, this, this carries all the way up. And I'll say it's not their fault because nobody ever taught them to do otherwise. But most managers, when I say, do you coach your people? They say, absolutely. And I say, great, tell me about that. And they say, well, what I do is I sit down with my people once a week and I find out, you know, what's in your pipeline and what's coming to close and what are we going to commit to and where are we at and what do you need for me to close these deals and whatever. And I say, that's fantastic. That's deal coaching. Got to do that. Mm -hmm. That, however, has, um, is, is a separate touch and doesn't have anything to do necessarily with professional skills development coaching, which means one, you have to observe behavior. So how often are you getting out there with your people, right? It means you have to be able to know what is best in class um, uh, look like for the competence you want to teach you. So let's say, Dan, to your point, questioning. What, well, what does questioning mean? What do you mean by that? Do you just mean asking a lot of questions? Mm -hmm. I teach questioning skills and I'll coach salespeople and they say, man, I was asking lots of questions. I'm like, well, let me get on the phone with you. Let me go see this customer with you. And they're asking all closed-ended questions. It's like an interrogation. They go, the guy didn't open up. And I said, well, you didn't ask the right kind of questions. It's just an example. But right. do we know what, what best in class looks like if we're going to coach to it? And if you're going to observe somebody, this isn't the one where you come in and close the deal for them. This isn't the one where you go in. And if you're really doing it, you want to be quiet and let them make some missteps. And that can be hard to do. You don't want to sacrifice an entire deal unless you're really just, it's a dumpster fire and you got to go and put it out. <laughs> you know? Um, right so that they can learn and, and be able to walk through that. And then the other piece is not doing directive coaching. So Dan, if I'm coaching you in a directive fashion, I'll say, Dan, um, appreciate that call. I don't know if you noticed when you said this, the customer reacted poorly. I think next time you want to try to avoid that, I might say it this way instead or say that till later. Also, um, you notice we really didn't do a good job uh, engaging the CIO. So I think what we should have done is duh, 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 and then, Okay, so any other, any questions on that? All right, cool. Ready, break. But that that's not how you coach. How do you think that went, Dan? And why do you say that? Oh, yeah? Would you have done anything different if you could have? And let's say Dan's not picking up. Dan, let's say, Dan, you just think, no, everything was great, and it wasn't. Yeah. I can still say, do you remember the part when this happened or when the guy said this? What was his reaction? 
Is there something that maybe would have had a better, where you think we had, a, we would have gotten more information on that? And then if they still go, well, I don't know, you can say, well, do you remember when we talked in our sales meeting about this? Do you remember when I spent time with you last month and we addressed that? Do you remember in the training when we, yeah, how might that have applied if you put applied that there? So it doesn't take that long. And when you engage people's prefrontal cortex and you get their critical thinking skills involved, when they figure it out, they remember it and they're more apt to do it. And there's more buy-in because they said it. It's just like when I teach, you know, like you say, asking questions for selling is if you ask the right questions, the customer will, will ask you to sell them. When you say, what are your problems and how big are they and how are these holding you back and how are these impacting the way that you're measured and how much money is this costing you? And if you could save even half of that, wouldn't you want to do that? And they go, well, yeah, but by doing what? Mm -hmm. They just asked me to sell them. Right, right. But we've got to realize, you know, we've got to take our time to go through the, the process. If somebody asked me the other day and said, don't you think it's kind of getting old? Everybody's doing the whole thing, find out about your business issues and whatever. And I said, no, I said, everybody talks about it, but every time I sit in on a sales call or go with a salesperson or do a role play where it's not during one of my trainings, they go right into features and products or they'll ask an initial question and then go, or they'll ask about the issues, but not get to the impacts of those issues. And certainly, I never seem to get to quantifying the issues to come up with the gap, the financial gap, to help overcome that um, uh, no decision and start to get them thinking about, you're spending the money anyway, you're just losing it. What if you could spend a piece of it, save the rest, pick up some efficiencies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think it still works. It's just that not everybody's doing it. So I think we're doing ourselves a disservice in the sales world if we feel like, um, we need to build a better mousetrap. I think we just need to, we need to focus on the things that we all know to do that we don't always do. I mean, I teach this stuff, but sometimes I catch myself in conversations where I'm not even doing what I know to do and I preach it and I write about it. And hmm. so it's easy to get caught up in. Right. Well, that's, it's, it's, you know, yeah. we've, we learned those of us who have been in it a long time, we learned a completely different way. So it's just mm -hmm. what we default back to. So um, I just think it's so uh, just vital. What, what you're, you know, and folks like you are providing today because, and really when you think about it, that training component is so critical in the coaching because it's, it's, it's a new habit. It really is. It's a new habit for most people. I, I haven't seen a lot of salespeople that just say, oh yeah, you know, this is how you do it. And, you know, uh, that, that's really a small group. So we're getting a little short on time. Let's give us a sense of um, what a successful uh, engagement would be with you, like what either if, if a specific client example or just generally what metrics uh, you've been able to affect um, in putting this comprehensive program together. And then before we leave, I want to hear about your new book. But let's uh, sure. talk about that. Yeah. So one with working with um, you know groups on prospecting as an example, um, you know their goal is to try to have you know twenty solid uh, twenty to thirty quality conversations a month or whatever. And I had people having 80 plus quality conversations a month to convert to leads. I had people doing over 200% of quota. I think there were even a couple extremes of people doing 300% of quota based wow. on the kinds of things that were that, you know, that I'm teaching. And so that's the other piece is coming in and understanding what are the KPIs? What are the key performance indicators? Um, you know, the lead measurements, most people just focus on the lag measurements, which are, you know, past, past results, which are what I do last month, what I do last quarter versus lead measures, which are best in, best in class hygiene and behaviors, where I heard a CEO one time say, look, if you focus on lead measures, the things you should be doing every day that lead to a sale, you'll accidentally sell something <laughs> because you're doing the right behavior. <laughs> and so um, I find out what are they using in the organization currently, and they make some recommendations if they need some, you know, some insight by looking at what are best in class people doing if they don't have that already well-defined. Um, and then we measure up against it because whatever – you, wherever you want the needle to move, that's how we're going to measure it at the end. Those are our bookends. And everything in the middle, the training, the coaching, the performance management, the assessments, um, all of that is how we get there. So it's funny. Um, I'll tell you real quickly. I have a friend who wanted to refer me to somebody because of the results that I get. And he said, yeah, I'm going to tell these guys that you're an excellent sales trainer. And if they need sales training, to let me know. And I said, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you mean? I said, this is about way more than training. Plus, people don't care about training. They want results. So I said, if you can tell them that you know a guy who's consistently been able to 
um, uh, increase revenues for sales organizations, decrease the length of their sales cycles and improve their win rates in as little as 90 days, depending on how long your sales process is and where we get involved with deals that are currently in play, is that something you would benefit from? What are they gonna say, no? That, but then they'll say, but how? How will he do that? That's when they'll ask you to sell them and that's when you turn them on. I can share kind of how this works. And so for me, it's all about the value proposition and what the outputs are for the companies that I work with. I've got 85 plus recommendations on LinkedIn of people that I've helped and supported and driven results for, um, for people that want to vet me and lots of videos of my work, my presentations, uh, interviews that I've done, et cetera, to um, be able to provide you know, context and, and uh, data for people to review. I mean, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, tell us about your, your, you got a book coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious. Tell us about it and, and what it's about. So the book's called, it's never too late to become what you could have been. How to use sales methodologies and leadership principles to achieve what you want in your work, in your life. And so it's, you know, I've been teaching this stuff and, and practicing this stuff for 20 years now. Um, I was a president club salesman and sales manager. I got into sales training, which morphed into sales enablement and keynote speaking and consulting and coaching and whatever. And you know, the hardcore concept, Dan, for sales or competency is the art of influence. The, the, the core co competency in leadership is the art of influence. It's the same thing. And so the art of influence is scalable in life. It's not just about sales and it's not just about work. Um, this is something that's kind of in my heart for a while. I do a lot of volunteer coaching and mentoring with some organizations I'm a part of. I do motivational speaking sometimes where I tell my life story and travel places and do things in, in, in another area of my life. And, you know, all of these things will help people with what they want to achieve. And, you know, whether you're young or old, the title of the book really speaks to no matter where you're at in your career, no matter where you're at in your life, whether broken relationships, financial hardships, um, uh, you know, failed plans or careers. Um, any other kind of difficult circumstance uh, or limitation, it's never too late to become what you could have been. And, uh, you know, and I share some of the really distinct challenges that I had early in my life that I was able to overcome and things that have happened along the way that, have been, that I've been able to kind of work through and deal with. And the book talks about who are you, why are you, and how are you? You know, the first section says you have to buy what you're selling, which is you. <laughs> so who are you really? How do you see yourself? Why are you family of origin? I, I reference some of Brene Brown's stuff on vulnerability and shame. You know, really, mindset is so important. Mm -hmm. And then, how are you? Meaning, how do you show up in the world with situations and problem solving, whatever, based on the paradigm? And then we get into what do you want? Most books like this get into setting a goal, driving through what do you need to. I start off, what do you want? And how do you know it's what you really want? Is it what your family wants for you? Is it what society wants for you? Is it what the you 10 years ago wanted? And is it still what you want? And let's really make sure. And I referenced some of Maslow's hierarchy needs stuff. And then we get into, okay, now that we know, let's come up with strategies and tactics to drive. Because there's a lot of literature out there, Dan, that success literature that focuses on, um, you know, go out and get them. And you got to believe in yourself. And I believe that. There's a lot of that in my book. But it's kind of like you read it and you're like, yes, and you're ready. And you get up and you're like, what do I do now? <laughs> now what do I do? So mine is a how-to of do this. Get these people in your life. Here's how you build a network. Here's how you leverage a network. Here's how you add value to others without expectation of anything in return. So they will want to help you if the situation increases. I just had a conversation with some people in an, an Apple store in Atlanta where I was getting my phone worked on and just talking to these young guys and no expectation of anything. And at the end, this guy's like, you know, I've, I've wanted to go in sales for a while and I want some direction. And would you mind helping me out? And I said, absolutely. Um, give me a call. And he said, well, you know, I would have to pay for that. And I said, well, I do have coaching clients. I said, but I, I just want to help you. I said, you're not at a place you can do that. Let me just help you. And I think when we do stuff like that, that things come back to us. Absolutely. I, you know, Ger Gerhard Schwantner was telling me a story, CEO of Selling Power Magazine, about being in the airport a few weeks ago when there was this elderly woman and she was, and they, and their flight was messed up and she was going to have to pay and she couldn't afford to pay or whatever. Or it, I don't even know if it came up because you can tell she didn't have a lot of money. He offered and bought her plane ticket for her just because, and you know, he and I were talking about how when you just put that karma out there, you just try to help people. Mm -hmm. It comes back to you. And the last section of the book just goes through examples of people that have had these, these wonderful, powerful, tremendous successes in overcoming adversity 
and achieving things in their life. Some, some that I referenced didn't even start their dream until they were in their mid sixties and built billion dollar empires. Tremendous. It's, uh, I got to get a copy of this because it's right uh, up my alley. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And I, along the lines of what you were saying, I was just uh, promoting another book uh, called Give and Take, which uh, talks about that. And um, uh, it's a good one for you to read, but it talks about the three different types. There's givers, there's takers, and then there's matchers. You know, you did mm. this, you know, I did this for you, so you have to do this for me. You know, I have to, the score is two to one, mm. you know. Yeah. But, at the end of the game, the givers um, were just more warmly received by people and they built such a, um, you know, a groundswell of, of support of people that it always wound up coming back to them. So uh, that's yeah. a, and it sounds like a great book. Well, Paul, this has been tremendous. Um, how did people find you on uh, social or what are some of the, you know, where will they find you on Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn? What's the best way to sure. find So my, I'm rebranding my company right now, right now I'm Paul Bickford Solutions. And um, so uh, I'm getting my website up. It's going to be Transformative Sales Solutions is named my company because of the Salesforce transformations I do. So I've got a marketing company working with me on some things right now for that. So for now, uh, LinkedIn's the best. I've got uh, 85 different recommendations. I've got videos of my work. I've got work samples and deliverables attached to the different roles that I've had. The website should be out before the end of the month, um, and it'll be transformativesalesolutions.com. And so uh, it's just not active right at the moment as I'm doing some yep. rebranding. But, um, but they can find me on LinkedIn, and I'm very active with the Sales Enablement Society and the Association, American Association for Inside Sales Professionals as an officer there, too. Tremendous. Well, Paul, stay on for a minute. We're going to end uh, our recording. Uh, thanks so much. This has been one of our best episodes and most informative. And uh, please come back at some point and uh, we'll look forward to chatting again. Hang on for a second. This is Dan signing off and uh, happy selling out there.